Now, there are many that fail to discern the signs of the times. They fail to understand what's taking place in our world today. So let me paint this in broad strokes for you. What events are yet to take place in our world? Bible prophecy clearly reveals the future. Prophecy does not guess, it knows, because prophecy has been inspired by a divine mind who longs for us to know what's coming upon this world so we can prepare for it. The tragedy is that millions of people, many of them Christians, think they know what's going to take place in the future, but have no real idea what the Bible teaches. They may have read a book about prophecy, they may have heard a sermon about prophecy, but they've never delved into the Bible themselves. You know, we can divide the world probably into four or five classes. There are those people who think they know what's going to take place, but really don't know. They have no clue. There are those people that don't know what's going to take place, and they don't know that they don't know, and they're really confused. There are those people that don't know what's going to take place, and they don't care. They're living life for today. And there are those people that know what's going to take place. They are heartfelt, seeking God in prayer, seeking him through his word, concerned about what's coming, and preparing for what's going to break upon this world as an overwhelming surprise. Now, there's no reason not to know the general events that are coming in the future. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Bible puts it this way, verse 4, but brethren, or sisters, brothers use generic term, men, women, but brethren, you're not in darkness that the day, that's the coming of Christ, should overtake you as a thief. You're children of the light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. In other words, watch and be alert. For they that sleep, sleep in night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be alert, put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of and, and a hope of salvation. In other words, we need not be locked in darkness. In Christ's day, Many of the Jewish leaders thought they knew what was going to happen. But yet, although prophecy predicted that Christ would come as the suffering servant, he would come as the dying lamb. They thought he was going to come in glory and might. They misunderstood the events about Christ's coming, and therefore they missed the coming of the Messiah. They missed the greatest event in the history of the world up until that point. Jesus had come, and they did not even know it. Now, there are many that fail to discern the signs of the times. They fail to understand what's taking place in our world today. So let me paint this in broad strokes for you. What events are yet to take place in our world? In Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, then the end shall come. So before the coming of Jesus, the gospel of Christ, the truth about Jesus, the truth of his word is gonna to go to the ends of the earth. Do you think Satan can read? He certainly can. Lucifer was once a bright shining angel in heaven. He certainly can read. You think he's read that prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, 14? He sure has. So if he sees the gospel going to the ends of the earth through internet, through YouTube, through Facebook, through radio, through television, through the printed page, through the witness of God's people, don't you think that the devil would do everything possible to stop those events from taking place? Indeed, he will. In Revelation, the 18th chapter, we find this prophecy again, the prophecy that God's word would go to the ends of the earth just before the coming of Jesus. And we see in Revelation 18 just how Satan is going to try to destroy that proclamation. Revelation 18, 1, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven. When you read about an angel coming down from heaven, it has to do with a divine message, a divine messenger coming to earth, inspiring God's people, motivating God's people. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. 
So here again is a prediction that the word of God will go forth with power in the last days of earth's history. The gospel is not going to flicker like some light on a candle and go out, but the gospel message is going to go forth with power. Now, Revelation 18.1 is really a commentary on the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2 and verse 14. And here's what Habakkuk says in chapter 2, verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as waters cover the sea. So every town, every village, every community, every individual in every major city is going to have a chance before the coming of Christ to understand the gospel, to understand the grace of God, to understand that Jesus came once. He lived the perfect life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died. He rose from the dead. He is our great high priest in heaven. He leads us to live obedient, godly lives, and he is coming again. That message, according to Habakkuk chapter 2, what did our text say? For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, the devil knows this is going to come. The devil knows that Revelation 18, 1, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. The earth is filled with his glory. The devil knows that. So what's the devil going to do? What is coming upon our world? What should we expect to take place at a time of crisis, at a time of national and international disaster, at a time of climate change, at a time when this world is suffering from economic, political, and natural disasters. The scripture says in Revelation 18 verse 1 that God's message, the angel, cries mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. What does it mean Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen? Now this is not the city of Babylon. The city of Babylon fell years ago when Cyrus attacked Babylon in 539 BC and overthrew that city. In the book of Revelation, Babylon is a symbol of confused, false religion. The Babylonians worshipped idols. The Babylonians worshipped the dead that they believed lived on in the immortality of the soul. The Babylonians were sun worshipers. So Babylon represents a false religion. It represents apostate religion that's drifted from the truth of God. It's drifted from the truth about dead when the death, when the Bible says the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Because if there is an immortal soul that leaves the body at death, then that soul can communicate back with the living. And if it can, it opens us for deception. 53 times in the Bible it says death is but a what? A sleep. And then Babylon was the center of sun worship. But throughout ancient Israel, the Bible said in Ezekiel 20, verse 12, how am I Sabbath that shall they shall be a sign between me and you. So the Sabbath was always a sign between God and his people that he created them, that he fashioned them, that his creative power would sanctify them. So what does Babylon represent? False religion that, accept, that has accepted false doctrines and God said that is fallen that is Babylon is fallen is fallen it's become the habitation of demons in other words spiritualism has infiltrated Babylon now notice verse 3 all nations that is all people have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication in the Bible wine represents false doctrine in the book of Psalms it says that God would pass around the cup of salvation in other words, in God's cup, there's the pure juice of the grape. It's not fermented. It is not tainted with falsehoods. Here, all nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What is fornication? Fornication is an illicit union. The book of James says, you adulterers and adulteresses, friendship with the world is at enmity with God. And so in the Bible, a pure, true woman represents the bride of Christ. A pure, true woman, Jeremiah 6, verse 2, I liken the daughter of Zion to a delicate, comely woman. The daughter of Zion is the church. So God's church is likened to the bride of Christ, a pure woman. In Revelation 12, verse 17, the Bible says, the dragon, Satan, is angry with the woman. That's the true church, the pure church. 
goes to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's the last church that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, you say, we're God's people. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So God will have a people at end time that are filled with the faith of Jesus. They are totally loyal to Christ. They are totally committed to Christ. And in this loyalty, it leads them to obedience to God, to his commandments, including the Bible Sabbath. They worship the creator on the day that the creator is set aside as a memorial of his creative activity. But Babylon, all nations have drunk the wine of the cup of the false doctrine. They commit fornication. They leave their true lover, Jesus. And who do they unite with? The Bible says, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Who are the kings of the earth? The political leaders. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So here you have a triple union. Get this picture. There's a time of crisis. The gospel is going to the ends of the earth. It is, the earth is being filled with the glory of God. There's famine, earthquake, fire, flood, natural disaster on the world. The devil moves to unite false religion that's drifted from the word of God, political powers, and also economic powers. This triumphant of error unites. They unite and see God's people standing loyal and firm to him. They see the world in chaos and confusion with earthquakes, natural disasters, economic collapse. Did you know the book of Revelation predicts that economic collapse? Let me read it to you. Revelation chapter 18. We're looking there at Revelation 18. We begin uh, with verse 7. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow I give to her. Therefore her plagues will come in one day. Verse 8. There'll be mourning, famine, fire. And she shall be utterly burned with fire. The Lord is judging her. So you see what's happening here. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. Uh, what about that economic collapse? You'll find that here in Revelation 18, verse 12. The merchandise of her gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen. Uh, that will be no more. Verse 15. The merchants of these things that were made rich by her stand afar off in fear for her torment, weeping and wailing. The Bible goes on to say in verse 19. They cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city wherein she made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costly. In one hour, she is made desolate. One hour. So what does the Bible predict? It predicts that at this time of the union of church and state and false religions and economic powers, in this triumvirate of error that's supposed to bring peace on earth, that there indeed is famine, earthquake, fire, flood, war, and that very quickly there is a rapid economic collapse. This infuriates the devil. And so what does the devil do? The devil attempts to destroy God's people who are standing loyal and firm to him and keeping his commandments. Revelation chapter 13 describes the working of the devil. And it says in Revelation chapter 13, that the devil will deceive those that dwell on the earth by means of the miracles that he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So there's false miracles that are being worked by apostate religion that is not keeping God's law. He has power to give life to the image of the beast. So the image of the beast should speak. What is the beast? The beast is a political religious union. How does the beast speak? How do any nations or political alliances or religious alliances speak through the laws they make? He should speak that they should make an image of the beast. And if they don't make an image of the beast, they should be killed. He causes all, verse 16, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell, save he had the number, had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So God predicts in the future that at a time of international chaos, at a time of conflict around the world, at a time of natural disaster and economic collapse, at a period of this time that the mark of the beast will be enforced in an attempt to unify the world to supposedly bring peace back on earth again. 
what is God's appeal during this period of time? What is God's appeal to his people during this period of time? We go back to Revelation chapter 18. And we look there at Revelation 18, 4. This is God's appeal. And I heard another voice come up out of heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Where are many of God's people? They're in religions that are confused. They're in a, religions that have turned their back on the principles of God's word. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. Notice, come out of her, my people, that you receive not of her sins. How does the Bible define sin? What is this a call to come out of? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 3 verse 4. Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. For you know that he was manifest to take away our sins. In him is no sin. So here the Bible says sin is the transgression or the breaking of God's law. So in Revelation 18, verse 4, when it says, come out of her, my people, that you may be not partakers of her sins, what it's really saying is come out of every law-breaking church. You remember we quoted Revelation 12, 17 and Revelation 14, 12, talking about God's end-time people, talking about the people in the last days. Now, what I want you to see is the context of Revelation 14, verse 12. In Revelation 14, verse 6, we have God's last day message to go to the ends of the earth. In verse 7, it says that God's people would be saying, the message would say with a loud voice, fear God, that's reverence, respect God, give glory to him in the way we live. The hour of his judgment is come. In other words, we're living in the judgment hour just before the coming of Jesus. Worship him that made heaven, earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. In other words, worship the one that made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters. Worship the creator. You know, that expression, the, he, the one who made heaven, earth, sea, and the fountains of waters, that is an expression from the fourth commandment that says, remember the Sabbath. And uh, then it says, for in six days the Lord made heaven, earth, the sea, and all that in them is. So worshiping the Creator is linked to worshiping the Sabbath. So rather than worship the Creator, verse 9 says, the third angel followed them, saying, if any man worships what? The beast in his image. So you have worshiping the Creator by keeping the Creator's Day, the Sabbath, you have worshiping the beast, and in contradistinction to worshiping the beast, in verse 12, here is the patience of the endurance of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So you have those in Babylon who are in confused religion, who are part of this triumphant of error, of political, of economic and religious powers all that unite, and God says, come out of her, my people, his people in those law-breaking churches. So you have those who are part of Babylon, who are in organizations or churches that are breaking God's law, but yet they're honest in heart, and God calls them to come out, to be part of his true church, to be part of his true people, to be part of those that love Christ with all their hearts, that stand loyal to Christ in the last days, that by his grace and through his power, keep his commandments. Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says in 1 John 2, verse 6, if you, if you say that I know him, but keepeth not his commandments, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. Jesus is making his final appeal. Do you hear Christ's appeal? Many people have no idea what's coming in the future. They have no idea that the mark of the beast will be enforced. No idea that they are part of apostate religious systems. No idea that church and state and economic powers are going to collapse, are going to unite. No idea the economy is going to collapse. No idea the crisis we're facing. But Jesus says you can be a children of day and a children of the light. Listen to the appeal of God to your heart. There is no accident that you are watching this YouTube video. Jesus is appealing to your heart. He's appealing to you to make a decision. He's appealing to you to follow him. He's appealing to you to step out and be part of his last day people that love him enough to be obedient and stand loyal for him and keep his commandments. Will you say, Jesus, 
I want to follow you. Jesus, I keep give my life to you. Jesus, all I want is what you want. I see the crisis is coming, and I want to be on Jesus' side. Jesus will protect you. You are secure in the arms of Christ. He is our refuge. He is our security. He is our confidence. In him, we are safe until the day that he comes again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you with all of our hearts that in Jesus we're safe, in Jesus we're secure, in Jesus we have refuge. We need not fear what's coming because in Christ, in Christ alone, we are protected from the wiles of the devil. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have been moved by this presentation, look at the web address at the bottom of the page or that runs across your page. Write to us. If God's leading you to make a decision, maybe to follow Christ, maybe to keep the Bible Sabbath, maybe to be baptized, let us know about that. We'll pray with you. We'll counsel with you. We'll give you some resources. I've got a wonderful Bible course. We're happy to get you involved in it. But just let us know. Send us a message on our webpage with the web address we'll give, and we'll be happy to be in contact with you. God bless you as you stay faithful to Christ and his word.